I did three videos that I had lined up and the first two just like were bombs, they did nothing. And so I said to my wife, like, I'm, I'm done with TikTok. I'm, <laughs> I'm not doing this anymore. It's, it's just such a waste of time. I can't get it. And then the third one, I posted it. I quit the app and I didn't go on it for like a few days. And then I opened it just like by force of habit. And I saw that had blown up. So I was like, oh crap, it's happening, it's happening. Did another video, which went even crazier. I think in the first week it went up to like two million views. I was like, damn, this thing's, this thing's really good. Like that crashed our website. I just had to stop all the Facebook ads and I had to put a big banner on our site to say that we were like two weeks delayed because we, we're only a small business and our um, capacity just couldn't handle that. Hello and welcome to D2C Podcast. I'm Eric Dick. Today, we're getting all soft and gooey with Joel Twyman, the co-founder of TheMarshmallow.co. Having experienced moderate growth in Australia throughout 2020 and 2021, Joel started dabbling with TikTok organic posts in late 2021. It only took him three videos to go viral for the first time, and to date, TheMarshmallow.co has gathered over 100 million video views on their content and grown over 2,000% in sales. CPG brands, take note, this is your clarion call to start making content showing how the sausage is made on TikTok. Listen to this podcast to hear the whole sticky story, including the exact TikTok formats driving millions of views and thousands of sales for Joel and the Marshmallow Co., how to get over 100,000 viewers on your lives on TikTok, how to turn trolls into gold, and why every CPG brand should experiment with slapping the marshmallow. You're going to want to hear all about it. On with the show. Hey, retailers, ever feel like your shopper experience feels just like everyone else's? Here's an idea. Put your shopper first with the only personalization platform that is purpose-built for retailers. Bluecore combines retail data and predictive intelligence to match online shoppers with the products they will buy next across channels like email, site, paid media, social, and SMS. Automate and scale your personalized content offers and recommendations for each shopper in a one-on-one, -on -one individualized experience. Visit bluecore.com to see why brands like Noble, Express, and Bliss have gone shopper first to drive repeat purchases and increase customer lifetime value. Welcome to the D2C podcast, Joel. How's the marshmallow biz? Yeah, thanks for having me here. It's, um, I'm really happy to be here. It's, uh, it, yeah, it's been really good. It's uh, it, one of those things people don't, don't think about marshmallows when they think about uh, eating a sweet. So it, it's, um, it's been really awesome for us this last couple of years. Can you talk about why you started it, wh where it came from, the idea? Yeah, um, it was actually purely by accident. Um, my wife and I love marshmallows, and one day I got home from work, and we were having a bonfire um, in our backyard, and she made all these marshmallows, like heaps. And um, and so we enjoyed them that night, of course, but I had heaps left over, so I took them to work. She took them to work and gave them to family and friends. Um, and then they just loved them. And, um, and the next morning I was getting messages from people asking if they could buy some for like parties or um, if they could take some home for their wives and stuff like that. So um, it just kind of, we started making marshmallows more and more um, after that and then just kind of grew to be like we started doing markets in our local area, then opened a shop because we were, we were sharing a commercial kitchen at the time. We needed our own kitchen. Um, and then when COVID happened um, in 2020, we no one could come into our shop, so we had to then start focusing more on our online um, business. So started really focusing on that then, and um, and then yeah, just shipping all over Australia and now um, all over the world. Yeah, let's we'll we'll get into that. It's 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 a pretty amazing story. You actually reached out. Uh, when we were talking about TikTok in the newsletter and I was asking for success stories for organic TikTok and you sort of reached out and put up your hand and said, I've got a pretty interesting one to talk about. Can, can you can you talk a little bit about your growth story and the, the pivotal dis uh, difference that TikTok organic has made in it? Yeah, so we, um, yeah, when we started selling online, um, we didn't start with any ads originally and then um, obviously started running Facebook ads Um for probably about a year and a half, um, even longer than that. And then started to notice, obviously, with the iOS update that things were getting more expensive, it was getting more unreliable, um, and I didn't want to be just tied to one platform. Um, so at that point, we kind of made a decision, alongside a few other things, 
but we were going to try and do TikTok properly. Um, I'd heard a couple of cool stories on the podcast and um, in the newsletter and other people I knew that were, were doing TikTok really well. Um, and so I thought, oh, I'll just give it a go. So I made, um, we had done TikTok in the past, but we, we hadn't really done it properly. Um, so I thought I'm just going to use this platform for like two months, figure it out, see what, what, like how it clicks, um, and then try and just try my own thing. So I did um, three videos that I had like lined up and um, two of the first two just like were bombs. They did nothing. And so I said to my wife, like, I'm, I'm done with TikTok. I'm, <laughs> I'm not doing this anymore. It's, it's just such a waste of time. Um, I can't get it. And then the third one, I posted it and then I quit the app and I didn't go on it for like a few days. And then I opened it just like by force of habit because I was on the thing all the time before that. And I saw that had blown up. So at the time it had like, it's blown up for that at that time was like 40,000 views um, compared to the other ones, which had like a thousand max. So I was like, oh crap, it, it's happening, it's happening. And then that video at that time blew up to like 300,000 views. Um, and it, it was really awesome, of course. Like um, we got a whole bunch of new sales in um, all over, uh, oh, sorry, yeah, a whole bunch of new sales, but also like a lot of inquiries from all over the world. And we were only shipping in Australia at the time. Um, so it was it was one of those things like, oh crap, do I like just try and do international without knowing if it's going to work or whatever. Um, I didn't, I just left it to Australia at the time. And yeah, we saw a massive sales spike from that. And then did another video, which went even crazier than that. It, like, I think in the first week, it went up to like, 2 million views, the next video. And I was like, damn, th this thing's, this thing's really good. Like that crashed our website. Again, people couldn't order international. Um, but it had kind of like got our name out there. We were getting followers like, in two videos, we surpassed our Instagram following and we had been doing Instagram for like two, three years before that, um, like consistently, like properly Instagram. Um, and so I'm looking then, at it yeah, now, you're at 118 million views so far on TikTok. Oh, is it? <laughs> That's what it says on, I'm on your, on your profile, the Marshmallow Co. It says 118 million views, which is just astronomical. That's crazy. Yeah, that yeah, it's crazy. Like the the amount of people who are, are seeing it, um, and yeah, it's just like it's such a cool platform for that. Like it's insane. I don't think we would have got that amount of views on any other platform combined. Now, take me back to those first three videos. What 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 was different about the third one? Did it just hit the algorithm right? Like what what did you change between those first three videos that was different on the third one that caused it to hit? Do you think? Yeah. So the first one I talked about. Um, I can't remember what the first one was. It was, oh, the first one was just basically, I think, showing our product and with music. So it was more of like our Instagram style. Um, then the second one was about um, packing orders for Christmas. So it was like the small business story of showing like the um, labels on the ground, like a long row of labels, and then the boxes getting stacked and shipped out. Um, and then the third one was... Um, about me actually making some of our products. So some of our cinnamon rolled marshmallows. Um, and, um, and then, so I kind of showed the process of how we made it and then packaged it um, and then just talked over it. So I just did my voiceover. Um, and I thought like the first, the first packing one had, had voiceover too, but that kind of didn't do anything. I think the, the combination of um, the showing the product, like being a bit educational and showing how we make it and, putting the voiceover and telling a story. I think that combination worked really well for us and it has done since then. Um, but it was also that first video, I made a few mistakes and the, so there was a bit of trolling on there and I wasn't ready for that, but the trolling actually helped. Like as much as it, it really kind of hurts when-, when Hurts your you, ego a little bit, yeah. Yeah, like people like ripping you off and stuff, like pointing out your mistakes. Um, it, it actually boosts up your um, your engagement on the algorithm. So the algorithm's like, damn, this video must be really good because all these people are commenting on it so quickly. They don't know that they're flaming you on there, but, um, but it I've works. I've seen that as a strategy that, that creators use as well, where they'll purposely do something that's like really off or something that, and the whole point of the video is just doing them, them doing something that they know is going to like activate people because it's off. You know, it's, it's an interesting strategy. You're not doing that yet. 
I actually have a, an idea to do that for a video. It was going to be like a toasting a marshmallow over the fire, but getting it like really black and saying, this is the perfect, perfectly <laughs> toasted marshmallow. You may not believe <laughs> it, but this is the like perfect sugar. marshmallow format. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I just want to trigger some people with that and see how, how that goes. But um, most of our videos, I don't do that, no. In most of the videos, I, I just try and be kind of more educational um, and or entertaining with, with what and, we do. And you have a version, you're, luck, you're also, be, you benefit because you have a product that is like the visual like equivalent of ASMR, right? You, you It just moves yeah. in these interesting ways and you can show it stretching and, and moving it around. Uh, I'm sure it's just an endlessly fascinating thing that people just kind of welcome in their feeds. It's it's a it's literally a confection. So it's like who can get upset with you know something this delicious and and you know such a treat? And it's the kind of thing people will just go down the rabbit hole and watch for hours. I imagine not hours, but watch quite a bit of. Well, they do watch for hours because I do lives now on TikTok. Um, and compared to so I've done Instagram lives in the past, and I've had like twenty viewers max. When I do a TikTok live, I can get like I think we we maxed at like 9,000 concurrent viewers. Um, and we regularly get like one to 2,000 when I'm doing a live on there. And all I'm doing is just working, just cutting marshmallows. And then I like hold it up to the camera and do some squeezes. Like it's, it's fun for me to do. Um, and it keeps that part of my job um, really interesting. Um, but people have sat there. I've done one that was four hours. Someone sat there, or well, a lot of people, sat there from the start to the finish and just commented and talked to me on there. And it's, it's really cool that people are doing that, but it's also like four hours just watching me cut marshmallows. It's crazy. It is nuts. Um, okay. Talk about growth though. So you, you, you know, obviously you're, you're a hundred, a hundred some odd million views in. I, I'd, I'd like to know what that would cost if you were going to buy that on Facebook or Instagram, Instagram, you know, hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars, potentially what, uh, you know, what have the, what has the growth been like from, from this? Yeah, it's been crazy. So at the start of the year, when we started doing, we turned on international shipping and we had like a couple of viral videos um, in a row there. It, I just had to stop all the Facebook ads and I had to put a big banner on our site to say that we were like two weeks delayed because we, we're only a small business and, um, and our um, capacity just couldn't handle that, like that amount of orders coming in um, at the time. So yeah, it's, it has been really crazy good. Um, like we've scaled back a lot of our Facebook spend um, to focus on just making content now um, and getting our name out there a bit more. Um, so we're like we're consistently doubling sales, like actually monthly now. Um, but before that, it was like year on year, we were just doubling. Um, but that's kind of my goal, like the benchmark I just have set for the whole team. Like I just want to consistently be doubling. Um, and so, yeah, we just got, because we manufacture everything, we've also got that side of things to worry about too. It's not like just trying to get orders and buying a product from overseas and getting it sent to us. It's, we manufacture it ourselves. So all the headaches with, with scaling manufacturing is, is similar to the headaches you've got with scaling growth and, um, and scaling a team. So it's, yeah, it's like a completely rounded problem. (laughs) How many times have you had to move to increase capacity during this growth spurt? In the last two years, three times, we've we've done three fit-outs um, of our kitchen. So <laughs> it's expensive to do that. And obviously, like, um, like a lot of time and, and planning goes into that. So it's quite frustrating. This one, we've, um, we've just, instead of moving again, we've, uh, we had a dessert bar. And so we've, um, where you could sit in, dine in um, and have dessert. We've just closed that um, for the time being to turn our whole seating area which was half of our space into like a little warehouse. Um, So we now make everything in the kitchen. We've got two separate kitchens up in there and then we take everything down to the little warehouse um, and that's where it gets picked and packed and goes out like more like a proper, proper uh, e-commerce business instead of like we were doing it before kind of like half assing both, both businesses. And um, now it's a lot better now. We've like, we're so much more streamlined. It's, It's so much better. And just breaking into the U.S., I remember, you know, when we were chatting before, you mentioned that, you know, attribution on your your TikTok organic has been, you know, one aspect of it has been simple, which is you weren't doing any advertising. Nobody knew about you in the United States before you started doing this. So pretty much everyone in North America who's who's ordering now came from this organic awareness, right? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I haven't done any ads for, um, for the U S yet. Um, because I just wanted to see how it go, how it went for the start. Um, 
So I can comfortably say that, let's just say 99%, because there could be some that found us on Google or something, but um, let's just say like 99% of people who've ordered um, from the US or from overseas, anywhere, New Zealand, U UK, Canada, um, they come from TikTok. Um, and we get, yeah, we get people from like, all these random little countries around the world um, and they're messaging like we don't ship to them yet but they're asking hey I saw you on TikTok can you please uh, can you please turn on shipping to my country so I can order from you um, and that's really cool like I got I want to make a little map now and just like start ticking off countries because I, I didn't plan to ever ship to like Cyprus or, um, or like half these little countries around the world that um, probably have nothing similar to what we sell but they're the people are so open and they don't mind spending quite a bit for shipping to, to get a unique product. What, what have been logistics like? What have the logistics been like expanding to North America from Australia? Is the, is the shipping just fairly pick and pack, fairly simple? Yeah, the shipping for us on our side of things is a little bit more complex. We've got um, like some forms to fill out for customs and stuff like that, which we don't for Australia. Um, but we kind of, it's not that complex where, um, where it's prohibitive. It's just like maybe... Um, it takes probably an extra few minutes per parcel um, because, yeah, printing out different forms and, and filling all that out. So it's okay for us in that regard. The shipping isn't ideal. Like it, it can take, it's like one to three weeks. And so everyone, because we're an impulse product, everyone wants their marshmallows today. Um, so we've got like a, a lead time where we have to make the marshmallows because everything's made to order. Um, and then the shipping time can can be a, a little bit, um, especially with COVID, um, the delays with, with some of the borders and stuff like that. But I think it's improving now. From what I've seen, like we had a few orders go to the US in the last couple of weeks and they seem to get there within like seven days, which is great compared to even Australia. Like if we ship on to WA, which is on the other side of the country, it can take like over a week or two weeks to get there. Um, so it's kind of like, that's just, I guess, what shipping is like all over the world at the moment. Totally. I talked to so many brands who are, uh, you know, they're talking about their, their growth plans in 2022 and they're budgeting, you know, what their ad spend is going to be. They're budgeting, um, you know, their growth is dependent on these ad budgets in a way. And I was just curious from, you know, you've sort of found this incredible pocket that doesn't appear to be going anywhere. I, I assume you're still cranking out like, you know, high view videos. How do you budget for growth on an organic platform like TikTok? Do you just kind of keep doing more of the same? Yeah, yeah, it is difficult. This is kind of what I'm um, trying to figure out at the moment, actually. It's one of the things. It's um, Again, I don't want to become, as we were, reliant on Facebook. I don't want to become completely reliant on TikTok um, because they change their algorithm all the time. Uh, you never know when, when something's going to happen. So um, we still have the Facebook, Instagram, um, organic and paid Um kind of chugging along in the background, just like at a much lower rate than what we were in the past. Um, and that could be scaled up at any point um, if TikTok starts to die down. But with TikTok, yeah, we're just like, the whole team's bought into it now, which is really cool. Um, before it was just me doing any content. Um, but now everyone's thinking about different ideas we can do. Everyone's getting more open to being in the videos and, um, and stuff like that. So it has just become part of our everyday thing now, like going live or making a video, a couple of videos a week and getting it out there. And um, yeah, we, we just kind of, um, I guess, set, set this new benchmark and we're obviously trying to grow from that again. Um, and yeah, I, I wouldn't say like we're completely tied to either Facebook or TikTok um, solely. We're going to explore new things out there as well. We were we were talking about it uh, a little bit before, but I uh, but I think yeah, you got to start getting that TikTok content onto Reels because I think that's it's like the perfect kind of content for Reels specifically. It's pre made. It'll have the the watermark as you say, which is you know a good uh, a mark of authenticity for Reels users when they see that TikTok watermark. Um, yeah, I think there's I think the sky's the limit for for the amount of free impressions there are are there out there for a product like this. And after after our discussion, I was just struck by like how many CPG brands I have on this podcast, how many CPG brands subscribe uh, to the newsletter. 
and probably only a fraction of them have made, you know, tried to make videos about, you know, what goes into making their product. Uh, in in North America, there's a, an expression. I don't know if it's the same uh, in Australia, but it's about you don't you don't want to see how the sausage is made, is what they say. But I think your but your brand is perfectly, you know, proving that not to be the case. This is a long winded way of saying what do you recommend for other CPG brands to take advantage of the TikTok opportunity? Yeah, I think. Um... Yeah, it's definitely like a combination of, sorry if you can hear my babies in the background, um, there's, it's, a, a, it's a combination of um, showing the products, like so, showing something that people don't see every day, um, so it's interesting to them, but also putting like a bit of personality behind it and showing um, that you're a small business. Um, I think the, the people come for the, um, the interesting product, but they stay for the, the personality or the, um, the people behind it. They want to feel part of something. Um, and so particularly with the lives, I get the same people on there all the time and, and they're talking about um, like this stuff that happened two weeks ago that I did on the live. Like one, one live I dropped a marshmallow slab and I couldn't cut it. Like I'd chuck it in the bin. And then people are still giving me crap about that. Like, oh, don't drop it this time. Um, so I think those people want to be part of something. But yeah, definitely like the just showing the product um what you find what what you find like mundane or your everyday job other people will find so interesting like i watch someone on there um who like i used to work in a tech company before but i watch people on tiktok who work at like google or facebook and they do like a day in the life of a product designer at facebook and that kind of thing is so interesting to me and my wife who, who's never worked in that space before um because you get to see that person's um, perspective on things, like what they've got that's cool. Um, and it's the same with us, I guess. Like I play with marshmallows all day long. I squeeze them. They're fluffy. I'm kind of used to that now. I've been doing it for years. But for other people, just watching me play with marshmallows or like they request me to slap them on the live. <laughs> and like for me, that's kind of a weird thing. But these people love it. And so like, of course, if people love it and I'm entertaining people, then um, I'll keep doing it. And I think every brand could probably find something that, that, um, that they do that people are interested in. At the very least you could slap it. I just, <laughs> I think we have a title for this podcast. I think it's called slap the marshmallow with, uh, <laughs> which, which sounds great. We all know how tough the past 12 months have been with supply chain and marketing costs rapidly rising. Ecom world is your secret weapon to help your brand get back on track and make this year your best year ever. Ecom World is hosting an online event that will arm you with the strategies you need to grow your D2C brand profitably. Meet experts like Kellen Fitzgerald, head of Ecom at Glow Recipe, and Davey Fogarty, CEO of The Udi, as well as 80 other Ecom experts who are paving the way in D2C. Get their step-by-step -step strategies to optimize the growth of your Ecom brand right now. D2C listeners receive 30% off the ticket price, so head over to ecomworldconference.com slash DTC to get your ticket now. That's ecomworldconference.com slash DTC. It's, it's just, I think it's, it's the opportunity of, of a, gen, of a gen, generation in, in some way. Like I've been in the, in the traffic driving game for, uh, you know, since 2007 or so even, and there's never been this kind of opportunity um, for authenticity, just that you can kind of bring with your own phone. Um, I, I like that you've you've built in uh, this idea of the the voiceover as as part of that. I, I think that's a really good idea. And the other point that I would stress that you've mentioned is that you've got your team to buy in on it. I think that's a huge huge aspect. So it's not just always you driving it; it's everyone thinking about how they can do it. Have you, I was wondering, have you incentivized the team in any way? I don't know. I don't know if they're listening, but is there a way that if they if someone produces a viral video that drives a huge amount of sales, that they can benefit from it? So I, this was before I, um, I actually went viral myself um, with it. I told the team that whoever can get a viral video to hit 50K, um, I'd give them a bonus. Um, and so really trying to drive that. Um, two of the girls went off and made TikTok straight away. And then I think they got a bit disheartened because it didn't go viral. Um, mm. So then like we haven't done that since then because it's just kind of been me um, publishing them. But now I think, yeah, it's definitely been the last two, three weeks that everyone seems to, to be buying into it a lot more. Like I've just forced them to do the lives now. So yeah, I probably will look at bringing that back because it's so hard when I've got like a million other things to do um, to scale everything else to then just go in there and, and make content. Um, 
it, it does become um, quite difficult just relying on one person. So, um, yeah, I think we'll probably bring that back. Um, and, it, like, they were really excited at the start. And I think um, just from what I know now, I, I should have probably told them, like, don't be disheartened. It's like it's very difficult to go viral. It's not something that's going to happen straight away. Um, and you could publish the same video like three or four times. Um, and then the fourth time it could go viral. So it's also about like publishing at the right time, having the right people see it, the right engagement at the start or whatever. Like it, there's so many different things that go into it. Um, so yeah, like that we are, I think we should bring that back because it's, it's, um, it is really good for to have the team and different perspectives on things too. I'm seeing a great Charlie and the Chocolate Factory motif emerging here. You can't ask your employees to dress up like Oompa Loompas. That's not probably going to go over well. <laughs> um, the, yeah, well. The, other, the other idea I'd bring to the table too, it's something that we're actually doing on our side. We've actually partnered with an influencer um, for a pretty affordable price to actually start making content on the regular, like having this person who's already got a following um, who's doing ads for us and is now actually going to be creating some more organic content for us as well. So it would be quite, I think it could be possible for you to even potential with like more of a pro influencer kind of in your area and actually even have them be your content maker, like in your fact, in, you know, in your facility, it could be an option as well. Yeah, I'm actually looking at that right now. We've got a um, an intern that's come in, so just a, a uni student, and she's um, come in, and part of her work, she's doing two projects for me. One of them is an influencer project, um, and the other one is a is making content with me um, nice. to kind of ease that a bit. So we, I'm just kind of seeing how that goes now, um, and yeah, I think the content that we're going to get from the influencers will probably... Um, guide our learnings a bit on how we make content ourselves and if there is a really good one like a local one then yeah I'm definitely keen for that because they make such good content that's what I've, I've been trying to tell everyone like these are the influencers they those guys are, are that that's their job because of the content they make let's just make content like they make um, because people follow them they'll probably follow us for that type of content too yeah Agreed. And it can be a lift. I know in a, in a CEO's day or, you know, someone running a business, it, you know, it can be quite a mental lift to have to set aside time to create content. Uh, it really is. A, it kind of takes you, it's fun. I enjoy it, but it, it is a really different, uh, it's a very different kind of task than almost anything else on your daily workflow. Do you find that? Yeah, definitely. And it also, like, I kind of get a bit stressed out about it when, um, when I'm like trying to come up with ideas or I've got an idea in my head and I can't film it or make it because I'm like, this is my first time making content um, for our business. I've never done it before. So I'm kind of learning as I'm going. And yeah, when you're, you're also doing um, like growth stuff, you're trying to um, organize new equipment for the, for the factory or like organize stuff and everything to then take a break from that and try and be creative for one hour of the day. It is kind of like a bit of a, a brain drain. Like, what's what am I doing here? How do I fo how do I just switch off of everything else to focus on this? So, yeah, it's that is one of the things that I'm trying right now to to kind of just ease myself out of just being constantly in a content routine. Um, mm -hmm. But the thing is, like, it works so well, and it has been working so well. So why would I stop? Like, I I can't yeah. really I can't really stop it because. Um, it's the it's like the main thing that's driving growth right now. You can't argue that your time is spent better elsewhere, probably when you have this totally asymmetrical lever for bringing in top of funnel awareness to your brand. Exactly. Yeah, completely free as well. Like that's that is the the craziest thing for me. Like paying money to to get people through ads, um, but these people are coming completely free. All it is is my time of just making content. Amazing. Um, what do you like? What does it What does it look like? Like, how many How many uh, videos are you making a week at this point? How many times are you going live? So, try and I'm trying to do two videos a week. So, one at the start of the week, and one at the end of the week, um, and kind of testing different things like posting times, um, morning, um, midday, night time. Um, trying to test that out at the moment, and um, and like different styles of videos. But it is hard even to just do two a week, um, the amount of work that goes in, into each video. Um, and then lives, I try to do two a week if I can. Um, the people ask for way more. They want to live every day. Um, but I work a lot slower when I'm live, so it, it also becomes a bit of a burden on everyone else um, because they wait for me to do stuff. Um, and it's not the jobs that I would normally do. It, I'm only doing it because I'm doing it live. Um, yes. So... Yeah, I, I think 
that's one thing that I've kind of promised to all the viewers that we're going to become more routine with what we do with the lives. Mm. Because a lot of them, they spend, I guess for them, it's like watching TV or, or watching YouTube. They're, um, they're sitting there and, and they want to watch something and they want to watch us. So they want a, a bit more of a schedule around like, when are we going live to do cutting or when are we going live to do order packing so they can watch their order be packed on the live, um, stuff like that. When are we going to go live um, doing stupid stuff? Like I put a marshmallow in the microwave um, <laughs> and had heaps of people just watching that. So I think, yeah, that, that is one thing that I need to get better at is the, um, the schedule of, of what we're going to do. And just because we're small, like it's, it's just hard to do that right now. But um, yeah, by bringing all the other team into it, then we could probably say like this team member will be cutting today, um, join them and, and they can just watch that type of thing. And how many people are you getting on a live? So um, re- pretty much for the total time that we go live about like, a hundred thousand viewers um, in in each live, yeah, and, and that looks usually like it depends on on the type of live though as well. Like if if we're doing more of a making, then it's a busier one. If we're doing order packing, then I find the engagement is quite high, but the viewers are lower. Um, both of them get sales like almost as well as each other, which is crazy. Um, and so yeah, it's about a hundred thousand on like our um, on our cutting ones on average. So they're the ones we try to do more of. It's, and the, aside from, you know, the business is going to be holiday for, you're going to have, you know, uh, a big Easter, I'm sure Halloween and, and Christmas and these, and these kinds of things as well. But the content itself is largely evergreen. I imagine like a lot of the cutting and the ASMR style, you know, mi- microwaving marshmallows. That's the kind of stuff that TikTok is going to love to be able to sneak into people's feeds like year round. Do you find the content like hits big, but then also has a longer life as it also maybe has like goes viral again? Yeah, definitely. Um, so it, I don't know if they've changed something recently because it hasn't happened as much in the last couple of weeks. But previously, we were just having like three, four, five waves of virality on each video. Um, and so there was a video that I had posted at the start of this year. And then like maybe three weeks, three, four weeks ago, um, it had like another wave of virality. And suddenly, like out of nowhere, it had a million views in six hours. Um and I don't know what caused that. Um, I think just because it is that that evergreen content that um, I think it just like maybe one or two people or like a bunch of people just started seeing it or started engaging with it. So it pushed it back up on the For You page for other people. Um, but yeah, definitely like even the ones where we make it for an event, like we had some Christmas ones and they were, they were clearly a Christmas product um, and same with Valentine's but they still get the the push afterwards as well. And then you've got the hard thing of saying to someone, oh, sorry, that was just a seasonal product. We not we haven't got that available anymore. But those people hang around and I'm, I'm hoping that in the future they'll be easier to sell to when that seasonal um, event comes around again and I re-release that product because they've been waiting for it. They had their eye on it last year. Nice. You also mentioned uh, running contests. Can you describe uh, the, your successful formula for running contests on TikTok? Yeah, so it's kind of our, our um, we do a, a whole strategy around a seasonal event because, yeah, a lot of our products, we, we release a, uh, a limited edition range for, yeah, for Easter, for Christmas, any of those events. Um, and so what I've found worked really well is to um, run a competition and give away our, um, say, our Easter range or our Christmas range. Um, but in the like three or four weeks beforehand, um, run that competition for maybe a week, um, put it on Instagram. Um, I haven't done any on TikTok actually, but put it on Instagram, Facebook, um, and then just, and run ads against it too. At that time, it's quite cheap to run ads. So you're basically building a short list of people that would be interested in buying your product because people who aren't interested in marshmallows, aren't going to be entering a competition to win marshmallows. Um, no, five pounds so, of marshmallows, no. <laughs> exactly. It's like $100 worth of marshmallows. Someone who doesn't want to eat that isn't going to enter it. So we've already got like a warm list there. People who are interested in it, they might just be like a bit price sensitive. Um, so we then run the competition, give it away. Um, and these are fully legit competitions to... Um, they're, they've all gone out to actual customers. Um, and then from that, um, that list of people, 
I can then send them an email, a few emails, like a series, welcoming to them to our business. Also, um, giving them like a, a discount to, to buy from that range. So we don't do a lot of coupons. Um, we try to avoid doing that. But for those people, I'm happy to, to give them a bit of a discount to just to convert them into a paying customer for that event. Um, because what we find is the people who buy from our events will usually con um, continually buy from our events, like the, the seasonal ranges. Um, and so getting one of them in, t in, say, Easter means that I'll probably be able to sell them again for Mother's Day, again for Halloween, whatever. People are always, especially in these these you know tough times over the past two years, I think people are always looking for ways they can like ratchet up the the joy and togetherness and the like. I know you you know my, my mom is always trying to make holidays extra special, and so I imagine if you get a customer, you get you know you deliver surprise and delight as as your packages do, as I can tell from your videos, and hopefully I'll be receiving one soon. Um, <laughs> that you know you just put put people in in that good mindset, you know. Yeah. Exactly. And I think um, it's become one of those things like Easter last year and the year before, actually, these little bunnies that we do, marshmallow bunnies, um, people were buying them for their kids. And I think the kids are like swaying the parents like, hey, can I get some of those bunnies again? Um, stuff like that. And so now people are kind of associating Easter with our bunnies or our custom eggs that people can make themselves um, and Christmas with like our gingerbread men marshmallows and, um, and our hot chocolate. And I mean, Christmas in Australia is hot, so you don't really have hot chocolate, but we sell out all the time at Christmas because people are associating that, the repeat customers are associating it with what they had the previous year, and they're like, oh yeah, that was a really nice experience, so let's get some more. It's so smart. I think of Cadbury and their mini eggs and their Easter eggs. You know, they've, they've created these products that are just branded to this time of year. Mm -hmm. um, and you're doing that on a, on, a small, on a smaller scale for all sorts of families, becoming like a staple part of their celebration. Yeah, and we try to, to cater for, like, one of the big things we found was Easter. Um, there's a lot of people who are, like, lactose intolerant, but it's really hard to get something that doesn't contain chocolate at Easter. Well, our marshmallows don't contain dairy. So um, that type of thing works really well for those people who have a lot of trouble finding something. Um, and then we find that those people enjoy it a lot. Um, and they go and tell their friends who they're usually in a group of people that are um, kind of lactose intolerant or gluten intolerant. Um so then it kind of spreads around those communities too, or halal is another one. And, mm -hmm. um, and you just get like a whole wave of people from those communities that come and buy um, just for catering to, to those guys because it's really hard for them. So that works well too. Very cool. So I'm interested in your answer to this one. If, if we were to give you $50,000 uh, grant towards growing your business in, uh, in the next month, let's say, where would you be putting it to see the biggest growth? Yeah, so I'd actually kind of split it between two things. I'd split it between content. Um, so like we were just talking about, um, maybe bringing on someone or ramping up some content. I want to focus, I want to like give YouTube a go as well. Um, so like kind of just creating some more content, um, but also product development. So um, improving our existing product shelf life, um, creating new products um, that are, again, more in that like... Um, like a vegan space. Um, we're working on something, but it, it's quite difficult to get the, the texture right. So um, yeah, I'd, I'd definitely split it between that, like growth, um, like the things we know are working for growth right now, but also longer term um, growth opportunities. Very cool. And I, sh I, I should ask as well, we talked so much about organic. Are you repurposing the, the big winners in organic content into paid ads to drive more uh, direct response conversions? A little bit. Um, but not as much as we really should. Um, it has been something where I've kind of, um, not completely, but a little bit lost, um, lost my focus on the ads um, because, yeah, obviously TikTok's driving a lot of, gr of growth right now. Um, but as I start looking back into it, when we can deal with the capacity, when we deal with the capacity changes or issues again, um, we'll, I will definitely start looking at which ones can be repurposed. And I've got to, that's something I'm going to have to test because TikTok formula is, uh, or the format of the videos for TikTok is completely different to what you would see on Facebook. And I know Facebook are trying to drive reels um, as well. So it's probably going to become one of those things where it's, it's going to be even easier to repurpose that content. Um, so yeah, it's, I'm definitely going to look into it and test it out. 
Nice. What is your favorite product on the site? If you were, if, if, you know, you could only eat one other kind of marshmallow, what would be your marshmallow you'd go for? Uh, it's the bubble gum. So, um, yeah, I've got two, two favorites at the moment. One of them is the bubble gum and, um, and that's just like the kid in me. I just love bubble gum in anything. So like a fluffy marshmallow, I can't go past that. Um, and then the other one is the custard tart. So I don't know if you guys have them over there, but like you have them? Okay, cool. Well, I Portuguese. Yeah. I've had Portuguese custard tarts. If that if that's the same where they're sort of burnt on top, or they have like the blackened uh, on top bit a different. little bit. Okay. Yeah, okay. It's, it's a bit different. I don't know if, if they're outside of Australia, um, but it's like a, a bakery item that you get here, um, and it's got like nutmeg on top, um, mm. and it, it is really good. And so then we made this marshmallow, and actually I didn't make it at all. I don't make any of the marshmallows, but the team made this marshmallow, and... Um, and then they, they gave it to me to try, and they were like, guess what the flavor is? And instantly I got it, and it smells, tastes, and even looks like what you would buy from a bakery here. Um, so I'm really actually proud of that one because um, I think, like, they nailed the flavor on that one. So that's probably my second favorite at the moment. Nice. I know Australia's big on palova, which pavlova. is the, pavlova. Pavlova, that's right, the, the meringue dessert. And I want, like, it's not, that's not that far from a marshmallow. It's more of a drier, less chewy marshmallow, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Less fluffy. Um, but yeah, it's uh, oh, actually, it's pretty fluffy. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just drier. Um, it's yeah. It's, I love pavlova as well. Like if I have a birthday cake, it's pavlova. Um, yeah. and, um, we haven't tried a pavlova marshmallow, but, oh, actually I think we, I think my wife did make one, um, in the past, but, um, we've got all these ones where we've made them all before people request the flavors and, um, we're like, oh yeah, we can just bring that out of the vault, I guess. Like we, we have to rotate the flavors so much because we want to like keep a variety. Um, but yeah, that is another one. That is a good one to bring back. I completely forgot about it. Nice. Well, that's what we're here for. Uh, I, yeah. I just am really excited for anyone in our audience who's building a CPG brand, who will listen to this podcast and just start turning their camera on and, and, you know, going to their factory, showing how the, how the sausage is made a little bit. Um, any parting words for our readers for, for, you know, what, what you, sh- you think they should do to get started? Yeah, I think, um, well, for me, I was, I'm not very, um, I'm a bit camera shy. So, um, even my voice, I don't like listening to record. I didn't like listening to recordings in my voice, but I just did it. And of course, like the growth helped the, like, I was like, okay, I've got to do it now. I've got no choice. Um, but I think the thing is like ease yourself into it if you're not comfortable, um, being in front of the camera, but watch a lot of TikTok, start watching TikTok and you'll see the style of videos because you don't want to make like a YouTube style or a Facebook style video on TikTok because, it's completely different. You'll start seeing like the different things that the bigger creators are using, follow creators in your niche, watch their videos. Um, and you'll, you'll start to learn stuff that, that they do. Um, and then you can just, um, take inspiration from that and use your own product or your own, um, team to make similar videos. Um, and yeah, you, you'll just go from there and then you'll kind of find your own, um, your own voice and your, your own style of doing things that works for you. And don't be afraid of the haters. Engage the haters and and it'll yes. increase your overall views. Yeah, I actually like kind of not troll, but like go back at the haters a little bit with witty comments. Like I think that's the thing with TikTok. It's a younger audience. People aren't going to get outraged if if you say something that's um, that's a little bit like out there or like if you go back at a Karen on there, um, mm-hmm. people aren't really going to say anything against you. They'll probably back you up and like you even more. Um, yep. and so if you can respond with like some, a meme or something that's trending, then like, yeah, like that, that can only do well for you on TikTok. And if you're listening and you've got little ones or a loved one who loves marshmallows, you got to go to the and, uh, I think there's probably still time to get a, an Easter package in. So I, I strongly recommend you go there and, uh, and flood the site with orders. We'll see. I don't know if we'll be able to match TikTok with the podcast. Um, and if people want to learn more from you, Joel, how do you recommend they, they get in touch with you potentially? Are you on Twitter? What, what's your, what's your, your social network of choice? Um, yeah, I don't really do that much at the moment. Um, but I mean, if you want to get in touch with me, you can just contact me through the business handle. Um, I'm pretty much on that one more than my personal one. So yeah, it's at the marshmallow co. Um, and yeah, I, I'm happy to talk to anyone about, um, TikTok about any growth. I actually want to grow my growth network. So if anyone wants to, to reach out, um, I'm happy to, to talk to you. I'd, I'd love that. 
Perfect. Well, you're you're now our resident organic CPG TikTok expert. So we'll be coming back for more commentary uh, on future success. So thanks for coming on today. This was a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for having me. I, I really loved it. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening to today's episode. If you're not a subscriber to our newsletter, you can do that right now at direct to consumer all one word, dot co. I'm Eric Dick, and this has been the 